I gotta admit, I am really pleasantly surprised at how this episode turned out. Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. My name is Jer and I have been reviewing every single one of the UK versus the world episodes here on YouTube and reacting and sharing my thoughts to them. This was an excellent episode and there is so much to unpack. This is an incredible top six. I am really excited every single week for what's happening and what's going on because I just really enjoy this group of girls and I think they have such a fun dynamic. They are presenting really incredible things to camera and I think we're getting to see new layers of them every single week. And that's cool to me. It's not every single season that we just have a banger cast and this really was a banger cast. So at the top of my notes, I wrote that I thought Teresa was going home next. And spoiler alert, she did. What? But let's not put our chickens before the horse. Let's talk about something that happened last week. It wasn't so much here on YouTube as it was on TikTok. There's been a lot of Tia Coffee hate. And I understand that y'all might not like her drag. I understand that y'all might think that she's stiff. I understand that y'all might not be appreciating some of the things that she's doing this season. I am not like Tia's number one fan, but what I am really passionate about is making sure that we're not invalidating somebody's drag. If you don't like somebody's drag, that's fine. If you don't think that they were in the top during a challenge, that's fine. There's ways to say, I thought that someone did better and this person should have been in the bottom over X person, but that is not an excuse to say that someone is not talented or someone is not a drag queen or someone is not good at their art. They are not entertaining you in the way that you want to be entertained and that's okay. We're not going to invalidate anybody's drag here, even if we don't like what they're doing. Gucci? And that goes for everybody. Learn how to critique art. Learn how to critique performers. Because they're entertaining. And somebody is ultimately entertained by them. And if you don't like what they do, that's okay. We're not going to invalidate what they do. So we find out that Tia also chose Gothi's name, which totally makes sense. I'm glad that she didn't make a strategy move. And to be honest... I kind of don't mind that this cast is not doing strategy moves. Some people have said that they feel that the season's a little stale and boring because nobody's really being bombastic. But I present to you a season where we're just having a solid competition, where it's just super consistent, super fair. This is how shows like Boulay Brothers' Dragula do it where the best of the best get to move forward and the weakest ones get cut. And that's okay that we have a season like this. There are plenty of other seasons where it's cutthroat and drama and television and we can enjoy that. This feels like an actual competition. And I keep talking about in multiple different forms of media that RuPaul's Drag Race has really infected people's idea of what competition drag should look like. And that involves cattiness and cutthroating and backstabbing and drag doesn't have to be that. Drag can be just a really cool representation of somebody's art. And that's what I'm liking seeing this season. We're getting that. And I, I want everybody to be able to appreciate that idea as well. The big storyline this episode is about Hannah and how she has not won a badge and how Teresa hasn't won a badge. And that's sort of like a target on their back because they might not get to go to the finals if they don't have a badge. But Hannah's been in the top a lot. Just because she doesn't have a badge doesn't mean she's not doing good. It's not like she's been safe or low every single week like some other queens have been. Hannah is very consistently always at the top. It's just someone is just a little better than her. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that means she's consistent. So our main challenge is Strictly Come Prancing. And this is basically the season seven dance challenge which conveniently was called Prancing Queens. And there were a lot of parallels to season seven. They have to first off do a half mask, half femme look, but I can't help but wonder if the costumes were provided for them. The suits were exactly the same, which makes sense. I'd prefer that they got costuming rather than have to make something themselves. That feels a little unfair. So this was basically the season seven challenge, except we didn't have to do the clunky back and forth dance numbers. I hated that in seven where it was like, country robot like what the hell was that about what who constructed that who thought that was a good idea this was so much better just focusing it on ballroom and allowing the dances to be what they were so our three categories are quick step tango and samba and because marina won last week she gets to divvy out the pairs as well as which one of those pairs will do which theme. Marina did a good job at being diplomatic. I'm just really grateful that this is such an even season and no one's trying to sabotage each other. We have not, to my knowledge, ever had a season that felt 
this fair amongst the queens. And I'm really enjoying that everyone is playing the game fairly. We all love the drama and we all love the life's not fair moments, but a lot of us are constantly complaining that people get sent home incorrectly. And this season, they're doing their best to make sure that doesn't happen. Marina chooses Hannah Conda as her partner, and I thought that was very smart. Hannah's quick at picking up steps. Hannah's very funny, so they can do what they need to do and sell it and also have a lot of confidence on the runway at the same time. She chooses Tia and the Grand Dame to work together because of height. And I think that also makes sense because they're both so tall. If they were paired up with Scarlett or Teresa, it would just look really odd. And it's hard to do ballroom when your partner is significantly smaller than you. It just doesn't quite read the same way. And so the world's longest 69 gets to dance together to the quick step. And that means that Charlotte, Charlotte, and that means that Scarlett and Charisa get Samba. And I thought that was a good pairing. So I wrote in my notes that Tia and the Grand Dame are the producer favorites, that Charisa and Scarlett are the clear next outs, and that Marina and Hannah are the top four lock-ins. So this group, even though Marina was the one who chose it, felt very much in line with what production has kind of been showing us, is that Scarlett and Charisa are not making it to top four. I would be shocked if Scarlett's not out next. And then while they were getting ready, Tia said something that gagged me and said, we have five really strong queens and Scarlett. <laughs> that was so unnecessarily hateful. That was despicably hateful. <laughs> What I think is interesting about this challenge is that top six is generally where production starts to really show its cards, but I don't think that production really needed to meddle that much because the girls were set up in a way that kind of just flowed naturally with what I think would have happened even if they weren't paired up that way. Like, I believe in my whole heart that if Scarlett was with Tia, Scarlett would have still ended up in the bottom, but Tia wouldn't have, and Teresa would have been in the bottom if she was with Le Grand Dame, even if Le Grand Dame did just as bad, it would have always been Scarlett and Teresa, and they would have been judged as individuals rather than as groups. This feels very reminiscent to me of when they sent home Trixie in this exact challenge, because they were not about to lose Pearl. They were not about to lose Violet. Ginger was clearly the worst one, as was Pearl, but they would rather sacrifice Trixie to keep Pearl for one more episode. Tia and Le Grand Dame are developing a little showmance, and honestly, I don't think that's gonna go anywhere. I think this is just an extra storyline that they're feeding us to give us a little more reason to keep tuning in for the next week. We've all seen how showmances go on things like this. You're in heat, you're in a small space with the same people and you get really close to them really quick. It's easy to develop quick feelings and crushes and then those end as soon as you're apart. So I don't think this is going anywhere, but it's cute for the moment. So let's talk about the actual challenge because the girls all came out in the exact same time, which I think kind of levels out the playing field. In a challenge like this, with everybody doing different genre styles, paired up with different people that they might not be used to working with, you are not judged evenly. You're judged based off of how well you did in your role. But how do you compare something like Samba to Quick Step? How do you compare something like Robot Country? What was that other one? Like Twerk? Twerk Ballroom or something? Whatever the hell Kennedy and Pearl had? How do you evenly and fairly judge those things together? Because one is clearly meant to be camp. One is clearly meant to be more drama and funny. And one is meant to be spicy and sexy. How do you compare those? It's apples and peanut butter and fierce Brock allies. You can't compare those things together. So having them all be out together, doing the main choreography posing, it allows everybody to be evenly judged because if you do well in your segment, but don't really do well in the group number, it sort of allows you to be called out. Or if you do really well in the group number, but not so much in your pair, then it kind of changes the parameter of judging. So I think it makes everything a little more even and a little more fair for us as an audience so we don't get that dissonance of, well, of course this person was good. They had the better track. And even with this challenge, I felt that everyone had pretty even amounts of musicality to their roles. They had pretty good choreography. Nothing felt skewed towards one team or another, in my opinion. So let's talk about Marina and Hannah, who just dominated. There, there was no contest. 
Marina absolutely devoured that stage, ate up every single inch of that runway while dancing. And surprisingly, Hannah really kept up with her. I was worried that Hannah was going to shrink in the eclipse that is this small woman named Marina Summers, but she didn't. She didn't buckle. She rose to the challenge. She rose to the occasion and she had so much confidence. <sighs> Scarlett and Teresa. It was so stiff. It was so clunky. There was no rhythm. It was just bad, bad, bad. And they didn't even really have that much confidence either. Like if you're not a good dancer, be a bad dancer, but be a confident bad dancer. And neither one of them were confident in their lack of dance abilities. So it kind of just made them stick out even more. But then speaking of stiff and clunky, we had Tia and La Grande Dame who were even worse. In my opinion, dance wise, the two of them were the worst of the night. And they were completely out of rhythm and out of sync with each other. They weren't even in sync with the music. It was like they were just a half beat off. But the difference was they were selling it. Tia and La Grande Dame in the face really were giving this illusion that they knew what they were doing. They were faking it till they make it. And so much can be forgiven if you're confident in what you do. And we've seen this many times where people have come out in like the ugliest outfit in the universe on the runway, but they sell it with so much conviction and confidence that you buy it, even though it's not cute. And that's what they did, in my opinion. They had confidence in buckets, but I do believe that they were the worst team coordination wise and rhythm wise but that's on a technical level because Scarlett and Teresa were also really bad and stiff but they just didn't have the confidence to sell it so the runway was something that I thought was really fun and that was business in the front party in the back and I really loved what a lot of these girls did but I do think that they were a handful of misses so as always let's talk about the runway because it's my favorite part Marina comes out in this beautiful Devil Wears Prada pantsuit with these huge exaggerated shoulder spikes. And then she turned around and did something that I have not seen since All Stars 1 when Manila had those little TV screens on her belt for that Teletubby runway. Marina turns around and she's got an entire karaoke machine in the back of her dress. How did she get that in there? How was that rigged? Where were the wires? This is such a small, tiny little outfit. The, the wiring had to have been in the shoulder spikes, which construction wise is genius if that's where it was. That's where like the battery pack theoretically would be. That's where all of the wiring to get to the TV would be. This was a brilliant concept for doing literal business suit and a party in the back. It goes to show you that you could do something literal for the runway and you don't have to think too hard about it because you just understand the story. You would look at that fully and say business in the front, party in the back. And then her, even her presentation of Mike checking herself was so funny. Then, <laughs> I'm sorry, hold on one second. Hannah Conda comes out as this gold cat. No, sorry, next. <laughs> I hated this so much, it was rotten. Oh my God. <laughs> Oh, I hate it so much. Oh, it's so rotten. Oh, I don't want to look at it anymore. This gold fabric is so ugly. <laughs> I keep looking at it. This sort of like iridescent gold is so hideous. And this plain top hat with the Daiso cat ears. <laughs> And then the cat party in the back. <laughs> Jesus loves you. <laughs> this was despicable. <laughs> the makeup was really cute though. Next up is Scarlett giving us a Barbara Streisand recreation. And I thought this was beautiful. I think that the dress was a really nice reconstruction. Love the hair, love the makeup, love this tiny little simple bang in the front. The makeup was beautiful. It was kind of giving a little bit of Ka Katy Perry in the face, in my opinion. But then the back was just assless. And, you know, that's fine. I, I wasn't gagging. I don't know what I would have liked for this, but I don't know. Back was fine. And then we have Theresa May coming out in like a 60s glam look. And I thought the front was really beautiful, but I do agree with Michelle. Why are we back in the Inferno? And why does she have devil horns again? 
if this is like what she's really trying to brand is that she's the devil of the season, I get it. But like, we've seen it a couple times already. I mentioned earlier that this was a very season seven heavy parallel. And what is so ironic about this particular runway that Teresa did is that her luggage opens up while she's on the runway and out falls panties and dildos. And if anybody knows their Drag Race history, Violet Tchotchke was going to do this exact theme during the Glamazonian Airways Jet Set Eleganza runway. And her plan was to have everything topple out of her suitcase. And then there were just dildos and vibrators, butt plugs, panties that were all in there. But she didn't get a chance to do that because it was a quick runway. So that was a fun little season seven parallel that was probably completely incidental. Um, I didn't really care for this assless look either. I didn't really understand why it was a 60s housewife to a devil. But I guess that's Teresa's branding. Next up is La Grande Dame going to a wedding and showing us her bridal look. This was a beautiful look, but I did see the red weaponry first. And I think it's kind of hard to do something like this, like this kind of Kill Bill back type situation with a white dress. It's hard to hide that. So, I mean, the reveal was kind of already shown early. I didn't know if it was blood or what, but I saw the red sequin sparkle before. So for me, it made the turnaround less impactful because I already knew what to expect. Some of the other ones throughout this entire time, I've been really shocked to see what was going to be on the back, but this didn't really shock me because I could see it. And then Tia came out as Saint Sebastian, and I thought this was a glamorous, beautiful outfit. And then in the back, she has been impaled by arrows and is on the near verge of death. Gorgeous construction on this outfit. I really enjoyed this hair on her. I do wish that maybe it was slightly more teased in the front because it does look a little bit like sad pinata on the front of her head with those little tiny bangs that aren't quite scooped up the way that I would have loved to have seen them. But the makeup was gorgeous and soft. I really love this tan color on her. And I thought this kind of secured her into a mid placement where I feel like La Grande Dame was kind of like low safe for me. So if I were to rank them, obviously it's Marina first, then Hannah, then Tia, then La Grande Dame, then Scarlett, then Teresa. The critiques go pretty much how we expect them to. And I was gagged because sometimes at this level, the critiques are weird. What I did appreciate was that La Grande Dame and Tia got appropriate criticism. La Grande Dame got some really great dance critiques and then her runway presentation was mid and I felt like that was correct. I was going to lose my mind if they were like, you were so good in the dance and you were so good on the runway and you're a favorite because again, this is the episode typically top six is when the production shows all of their cards. They put everything on the table and say, these are our top four nobody's going to send them home. Good luck, besties. But that didn't happen this time, and I was grateful to see that. And then Tia got really mid-dance critiques, but got really high runway critiques. And again, I was thinking going in that they were going to be like, you were so good and we loved your confidence, and then your runway was perfect, and you're the winner of this week. Like, I was really expecting it, just because these two really seem to be the production favorites, and I don't see them going home by any means. The top two is Hannah and Marina, and this was so earned, so deserved. I enjoyed both of their performances. And then go back to do Untucked and to do the weepy, cry, fight for your life moments with the others. And through the whole deliberation, it's really feeling to me like they are going to send home Scarlet. They specifically reference that they don't know where she stands, that they don't have a good rapport with her, that she said early on that she would send home somebody strong, where they know where Teresa's allyship lies. They have good rapport with her. They trust her. So for me, I thought, oh my God, Scarlet is fully going home. There's no way she's surviving this. But again, this is a group that's playing really fair, and I love that. Because we get to the actual lip sync, Marina turns it all the way out. The lip sync song is Release Me, which is my first time hearing it. Marina was fighting for her life to send Teresa home. <laughs> Marina was doing every single move that she could pull out. She even did an outfit reveal. No one does an outfit reveal during a lip sync for your legacy. No one. This was so good. Marina killed it. Marina is showing that she deserves to win this season, and if she doesn't, there's going to be hell to pay. 
This positively was the best lip sync of the entire season. I was so thrilled with how it went. And in the end, Marina decides to eliminate Chiriza. And one of my favorite moments was when Chiriza turned and yelled, very surprised Pikachu, what? Totally joking, but also kind of serious at the same time. And I appreciate that she took everything with grace, even talking in Untucked how she couldn't be mad at her placement because we're in top six. You're kind of at the point where you're at the top or the bottom. There's not really any middle ground anymore. Either you are spectacular or you are less than spectacular. And she took her elimination really well because she understands that she's in a powerful group of girls. And it just endeared me to her a little bit more than I already was before. This was another great episode and I think it was because it is performance-based. Leading more into my theory that more of these episodes should be performance-based and not random little acting improv things to make RuPaul laugh. Which, that brings us to next week, which is a roast challenge. And I worry about Scarlet in particular because Scarlet does this thing where she is trying to be funny and so she goes up here and she tries to go like really valley girl but she's like changing her voice and like she's just trying to be really funny and that doesn't really translate that well to RuPaul. Ru doesn't get valley girl humor nor does she laugh at it. I think the closest that we've seen of that was when Mick did Paris Hilton but even then Mick was doing Valley Girl in like a really smart way, not in the way that Scarlett does it. I also don't think that La Grande Dame is going to do very well. I worry about Marina just because she doesn't seem like a comedian comedian, but I don't think that she's going to do bad at all. I think that this is going to be Hannah's week to get a badge. It's very clear to me that it will be Hannah and Tia in the top two. And this is very likely Scarlet's week to go home because I imagine it'll be top two, bottom three situation. I don't know. I really just feel like based off of Snatch Game and based off of that first improv challenge that they did, I have a feeling that La Grande Dame is going to struggle really hard to get jokes out to make Rue laugh in a way that you need to in a roast. And I just don't see Scarlet doing that well in a challenge like this. I just don't. This was a spectacular episode. This is a incredible top six. I'm so happy with where the season's at right now because y'all know I was a little bit concerned and I'm feeling less concerned. To me, it feels very clear who the top four is. And if this is a lip sync for the crown moment, let's just put it out into the world that Marina maybe gets Tia and sends home Tia. La Grande Dame ends up with Hannah and Hannah probably would send La Grande Dame home, which means that we might end up with a Hannah and Marina final two. And I would be so about that. And I feel like it could go to Marina. Unless production really says, nah, we're going to make sure that it's Marina versus Hannah. And then Marina wins. And then it's like Tia versus La Grande Dame. And they'll have Tia go through and then it'll be a Tia versus Marina to some type of silly camp <laughs> song, and they'll give it to Tia. Those are the two outcomes that I expect, but we shall see. What are you expecting from next week? I'm so excited. I hope you loved this episode as much as I did. I was glad to see the season seven challenge return, and I would love to see more challenges from past franchises get sort of reboot and brought into All Stars slash Versus the World seasons. And sort of see what those look like now, modernized. New takes, new perspectives, all of that. Thank you so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed this episode. And I will see you next week. Be sure to check out some of my other Drag Race content. They're all in playlists across my channel. I upload daily videos. So if you want to stick around and check out some of the other ones. I've been doing a lot of gaming in between Drag Race things. So if you like gaming, I'm the bitch for you. See you next time. Hashtag Team Marina. Hey, thank you so much for watching. If you liked the video, make sure to click that like button. And if you want to see more, hit subscribe. Goodbye.